I have often told the story of those tragic early days of my son's life when an attack of spinal meningitis at 17 days old caused severe brain damage and left him permanently disabled for the rest of his life. I, I've told that story more times than I can count. And I forget that I don't often tell the good years. It's, it's pretty dramatic to focus on the initial hospital crisis and of course uh, his health crisis at the end. But in the middle, we had a number of really good years where he was still peaceful and relaxed and his seizures had not become so intense that they locked him in a constant rigidity. And he, he would react and smile when the light came on. He would grin. We even got, uh, when we tickled him, we even got short bursts of laughter, uh, which is pretty amazing that interaction with him. But after a while, the seizures got so bad that um, he was having, you know, 10, 12 grand mal a day. So he just had to have medication. And of course, that medication suppressed the seizures, but it also suppressed that interaction we had with him. We learned to read his language, his body language, all the subtle vocalizations in any way that we could get information. And ultimately we all developed a kind of psychic connection to him where we would just hear a voice in our head that just had his personality. And every time we'd share it, everyone in the family would go, yeah, that's, that's him. Like I hear him that way too. You know, we all had this commonality between the way we heard him in our head, you know? It, I just think that really is his voice. Even though he was so profoundly disabled and had no mobility, couldn't move or control his limbs, no language, um, very little vision, pretty good hearing. Um, one of his favorite activities at, uh, during those years was to take a shower with me and I would just bring him in the shower. It was the easiest way to bathe him. I would bring him in and just let the water drip on him, dribble on his back, and then, you know, turn him around a bit. He loved it. He melted in the hot water every time. Just, oh, he would just relax and just lay there on my shoulder. And, ugh, oh, it was, um, it's one of the most beautiful memories I have of him, our, our time. Those, it was just a few years, you know, where he was well enough to get relaxed like that and small enough that I could handle him in the shower because he continued to grow. He lived 20 years and he wasn't quite as tall as a 20 year old, but pretty close. Uh, he was a big boy, I mean, five feet long. Uh, so hard to handle by the time he was of adult age. So we learned to hear him, you know, in our minds and read him and comparing notes with each other really have a sense of language with him. Well, on the night that he died, the whole family gathered, the ones that could, we gathered at the house that night and we held vigil for him overnight. We sat with him with candles lit all together as a family with him that first night. He died in the evening, late, maybe 10 o'clock. And so it was, uh, our tradition and our great blessing to sit vigil with him and family members that were away, his, his sister was too far away to make it that night. So we just had an iPad and she just FaceTimed in and just sat there with us, her face in that square of light and all the other faces there with us. And I was able to just hold him for a couple of hours after he had passed. And I had the thought that he was so relaxed, his body, so relaxed, I had forgotten those good years. In the shower when he had oh, just loved the water. And I remembered the night he died, he reminded me. In my mind, he said, ah, yeah. And that beautiful image juxtaposed in such stark contrast to the 
horror of the moment, holding my dead child. And yet having this flash, this sudden memory, and it wasn't just the memory, the image of him relaxed on me in the shower, it was all the emotions and the just like being there, suddenly juxtaposed that peaceful celebration, that moment in the shower and the uh, moment on the night of his death, my last moments holding him in this life. And the realization that two complete opposites can live in the same moment, utterly, a most beautiful thing and a most horrible thing at the same time, with exactly the same amount of vividness and completeness and demand for attention, coexisting, two particles and antiparticles that shouldn't be able to be there at the same time, but they are. And this is a much more common experience than we often give credit to. We're in an age that lacks nuance. Everyone has rejected the idea that there can be an overlap of opposites. We all think it's one way or another, blue or red, and everything else is canceled and dead. And that just isn't true. It's just not reality. But it's also complete antithesis of the most peak and impactful moments of life always contain that characteristic, that complete complexity. All complex situations or systems or emotions or relationships will involve complexities. Nothing is A, B, simple, cut and dry, nothing. And especially not the world at war in this current social dialogue. We lack nuance. My most profound experiences in life have always demanded of me to pay attention to multiple perspectives at the same time, horrible and beautiful. And that may be too meta for some of you, but I just had these thoughts tonight and turned this on and just speaking my truth tonight. Be well, my friends. I love you.